I'm Bill Black from the Walker Library here on campus, and I want to welcome you all here to the Science and Spirituality Forum. This forum grew out of conversations that four of us on campus had about seven years ago about putting together something that where we could talk about the issues that where science and spirituality intersect and the nexus of those, those two issues, spiritual perspective, scientific advances, and our human place in the cosmos. And so um, those individuals were uh, Rami Shapiro, who teaches in religious studies here and is a, a rabbi in town, um, Gary Wolfsburg, um, professor emeritus of chemistry, myself, and Neil Scott, who was one of our colleagues in the library. Neil passed away last year, and um, he was, this um, forum has been named in his honor, and Neil was a, um, a member of our library faculty. He was head of the circulation department. He was a research coach, uh, really a primary research coach, providing one-on-one -on -one research help to students on campus. He was an experienced library administrator and a Flannery O'Connor scholar and prolific author, as well as a surfer and a singer and a just around, all around great guy. Um, the structure of the forum has been uh, brown bags where we've gotten together a couple of times during the semester to talk about the issue in uh, preparation for the speaker coming in an evening, um, in, for an evening session. And we started in 07, 08 with uh, the view from the center of the universe, uh, which was um, uh, two individuals who came to us from California. And uh, one was, um, we had Eric Klumpy who teaches here in uh, astronomy, Rami Shapiro uh, from our planning group and then the cosmologist, um, Dr. Premack, Joel Premack, and uh, Nancy Ellen Abrams, who's a science writer. And um, they came and talked about our place in the universe. The next year we had, um, thank God for evolution, which was uh, Reverend Michael Dowd, how uh, the marriage of science and religion will transform your life and our world. In 2010-11, we focused on the television show Lost, and we had uh, Dr. David Lavery from the English department come and speak about that. He's a lost expert and the author of Lost's Buried Treasures. And last year, our theme was what the dying can teach the living. And we had a number of speakers here for our brown bag sessions and for our evening program. Uh, we had a couple of chaplains from hospice and MTMC. We had uh, an elder from the Methodist church. So we had the Presbyterians, Methodists, we had um, the Jewish perspective, we had the Islamic perspective, and uh, just a number of speakers. And then a professor of psychology, Bill Compton, here on campus, and Gary Wolfsburg from chemistry. And then in the evening, uh, we had um, Bob Fisher, who is president of Belmont University, and his wife, Judy, came with him. And they have both co-authored uh, uh, a book, Life is a Gift and their story about their work with people in the hospice program. And the vision for our program really was to bring together areas of science and spirituality in search of new insights and a broader vision of what it means to be human. It involves students, faculty, and staff from MTSU and community members in these discussion and often features a visiting expert, as I said. For more information on our program, I would refer you to our website, which is library.mtsu.edu slash spirituality. And it's now my pleasure to introduce Bonnie Allen, who's the dean of the Walker Library, now in beginning her second year, and she'll introduce our speaker. Bonnie. I don't know at what point uh, you can you begin to be not new at this university, but I, I started in March 1st about a year ago, and uh, I've had the, haven't had the pleasure of attending uh, very many of this science and spirituality, but one of the things that's been so impressive to me about this forum is that it, it seeks to understand bigger ideas, and, and it's brought together in the last couple of months uh, through the brown bag discussions and the campus scholars a really interesting and provoking discussion about um, the, the intersection of science and spirituality and why we think what we think. 
Uh, Bill has mentioned the, the planning committee, uh, and I'd like to formally thank them because it's been, these things never happen overnight or easily. Uh, Rami Shapiro, uh, Gary Wolf, Wolfsburg, and Bill Black, and of course, Neil Scott. Um, I'd also, I'd like to thank my um, colleagues from uh, the deans from the College of Basic and Applied Science, Bud Fisher and Mark, Dean Mark Burns from the College of Liberal Arts, who also helped make this uh, forum possible, along with Walker Library, of course, and the Committee for Distinguished Lectures on Campus, who's also contributed to, to the financial success. As Bill said, it is my pleasure tonight to introduce our speaker, Carter Phipps. Uh, and the, the, start, the starting point of all these discussions we've had in the last couple of months has been his, uh, his book called Evolutionaries. The book. Um, our speaker tonight says that evolutionary thinking has much to say about what makes us human. Um, the progress of meaning, as discussed in his books, explains the evolution of our thinking. Um, where we've come from, where we're going, and what, what has made uh, and shaped the things that we think about. Evolutionaries are a new generation of thinkers who are considered, considering the physical, biological, and cultural evolution of, uh, that forms our world view. And this world view provides a meeting point between science and spirit. In this world view, there's a capacity for spiritual fulfillment renewing our faith and possibilities of the future and even defining human aspiration. The emerging worldview and the evolutionaries, who are the, the ones who are engaged in creating this meaning, are formed in new discoveries in science, psychology, sociology, technology, and theology. So with, without any more delay, please join me in welcome Carter Phipps. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Very nice to be here in the South and in Tennessee. Uh, and thank you for having me to your university. And thank you to Rami Shapiro and Bill Black and everyone else who's been so gracious in the last couple of days. And it's been fun to be here and very interesting. And I've had a chance to go to some classes and teach a little bit. I got to go to, the, uh, to a Bible study class. And I got to go to a biology class. So that's a nice kind of mix. And it happens to speak to what I want to, uh, to speak to tonight, to the breadth of this topic. This is a science and religion topic. And my book covers science and religion, but it also covers psychology and talks about philosophy and talks about anthropology and talks about cosmology and talks about cultural studies. The book is cross-disciplinary by nature. And in the book, one of the things I talk about is I talk about the qualities. Come on in. I, am I on, I'm still on my, okay, good. I can be free of this particular. So in, in the book, I talk about the qualities of, of this new breed of thinker I called an, an evolutionary. One of the qualities I, I suggest that they are is they're, they tend to be generalist, well-informed generalist. I think our, our society is, you know, we have, we're, we're, we have come so specialized in our world. And there's nothing wrong with specialization. Specialization is great. In an academic context, you have so much specialization, but in other contexts as well. But we need generalists. We need people who can reach across disciplines to help us integrate our thinking. There's a role for that in society. We often lost it. Um, you know, they say, I was joking with someone, they say about specialists, Specialists know more and more about less and less until eventually they know everything about nothing. I think you're right. It's like, and there's a danger in being a generalist too, is that you know less and less about more and more until eventually you know nothing about everything. So I, I would tend toward that danger. So you can judge for yourself if that's true. Um, but nevertheless, we need people who can help us integrate our thinking, who can speak to culture as a whole. And in some sense, that's why I think the idea of evolution and the premise of my book is that the idea of evolution is a powerfully integrative idea. It helps us reach across different disciplines and begin to integrate our thinking into a larger context, a context that reaches all the way back to the earliest 
seeds of human civilization, and ultimately a context that reaches all the way back 13.8 billion years. They discovered it's not 13.7, it's 13.8. Someone told me today there's news, new news on the age of the universe. Reaches all the way back 13.8 billion years to think about and to consider in that context what makes us human. So that's not the way people talk about evolution usually, what I just laid out. I'm going to read you briefly from the introduction of my book, just a paragraph. It says, and I'm going to read a little bit, bits and pieces from my book. I apologize for that, but I like to read my, from my book. It's probably my own form of narcissism. You have to bear with it. <laughs> do you believe the Bible or do you believe in evolution? The question came in an urgent whisper, passed around my eighth grade science class with a guilty subterfuge of a dirty joke. I was 13 years old, and already I understood that there were two kinds of people in this small town on the edge of the Bible Belt, those who believed and those who didn't. I'm not talking about God. Everyone believed in God. I'm talking about evolution. And that's the world I grew up in. That's the context I grew up in. That was in a small town in northern Oklahoma, probably not unlike a small town in Tennessee. Very similar, where that debate raged strong. That issue of science versus evolution was something people were talking about, and it continues to dominate the headlines today. And let's see if I can get this working here. It continues to be such an issue. Do you believe in the Bible, or do you believe in evolution? And we can see it across the headlines and you know, all the big magazines and, you know, and intelligent design and evolution. It's a big issue. But I want today to try to extract the idea of evolution. And already you can tell that the way I'm using that term is more than how it's used in just a, a very strict context of evolutionary biology. I'm a, I believe in the science, just to get that clear from the start, I believe in the science. Carl Sagan was my intellectual hero growing up. I wanted to be an astrophysicist as a kid. I love science. There is nothing anti-science in my book, and you won't find anything anti-science in my work. Quite the opposite. But a scientific view of life in the way I understand it need not be meaning-free or purpose-free. To me, a scientific view of life and what science is revealing is potentially full of rich forms of meaning and purpose. And likewise, a spiritual based life or religious life need not be antithetical in any way, shape, or form to science, much less to evolution. Need not be. Quite the opposite. And the way I understand it, evolution is giving us new ways to think about human life and ultimately about religion and, and science, obviously science, but also about religion. I've met people who are using the idea of evolution to completely transform the way we think about God, to completely develop the way we think about spirituality and mysticism, for example, to completely change the way we think about theology in, in ways that are powerful and beautiful and full of rich meaning and full of spiritual depth and potency. So evolution is, a, is an idea, and I want to you know, I I start and communicate that right off. So, the first idea of my book, and if I can communicate really one idea to you tonight, this is, come on in, this is, this is it. I'm going to come back to that. It's called, it's a term I, I came up with called the spell of solidity. And to me, when you really begin to understand what this new way of seeing the world that is sort of evolution inspired, it breaks what I call the spell of solidity. What's the spell of solidity? The spell of solidity is the idea that we live in a static and fixed and unchanging universe. We are static and fixed and unchanging human beings in a static and fixed and unchanging universe. And our, you know, over the last 150 years, this spell is being broken in discipline after discipline after discipline. And we can think about biology. Let's start with biology, right? That's how we usually think about evolution, biology. We used to think that species were just placed on the earth. They didn't, they didn't die off. They didn't evolve. They didn't change. 
There was a sense of the static nature of biology, right? And what's part of what the Darwinian revolution taught us was that no, species change, they die off, they evolve, they go extinct. There's this, we went from a static view of what biology is to uh, a view where there's movement and change and fluidity and development and evolution. And in so many areas, this is true. Look at cosmology. We used to think that we lived in a steady state universe, right? This kind of thick, this, you know, this, we were in this place called the universe. And now what we're beginning to realize is that it's more complex than that. We don't so much live in a place called the universe, even though we do in some sense, but we realize the universe is this movement. For 13.8 billion years, it's this movement forward, this movement of time. We have to add that to our picture of the universe. We're breaking this spell of a static, fixed universe, and we're part of this movement forward. You know, it's very interesting. I went to uh, Florence a couple of years ago, and I was looking at, at uh, the art in Florence of the Renaissance. How many people have seen some of the art in Florence of the Renaissance, right? So extraordinary, extraordinary. And what you see in that art is you see for the first time in human history, they were beginning to work with perspective. I don't know if people saw this, but they were beginning to work with perspective in the art of that time. Meaning they were, they were the, in the consciousness of that age, they were transforming the way we think about perspective in landscapes, in painting. They were beginning to think about landscapes of spatial perspective and painting those perspectives in ways we never have before. I think I have some of the art pictures here if I can. That's a, the top picture is a picture from a Renaissance painting, one of the first pictures, I think, ever to use certain kinds of spatial perspective, right? So we were beginning to integrate space and think about space in new ways in the Renaissance, and that's continued up. Think of the way we think about spatial context now. We think of ourselves as this human beings on this third rock from the sun in the middle of this solar system, in this galaxy, in this vast universe, right? This that's in this vast ocean of the cosmos. That's how we think about the human experience. That's a spatial perspective on the human experience. What I'm trying to communicate, and what I want to communicate tonight, is a temporal. I want to add time to that experience. I want to add a temporal element. We aren't just human beings in this vast ocean. We are the kind of developing wave of a temporal process that's been going on for 13.7 billion years. How do we think about the human experience when we add that sense of this temporal process of 13.7 billion years of, human de of, de of cosmological development, you know, 3.5 billion years of biological development, 10,000 years or 40,000 years of, of human development? How do we think about the human experience in light of that context when we add time as well as space, when we break the spell of solidity in relationship to how we think about what it means to be human. So in all kinds of fields, people are breaking with like this, this spell. Even in neuroscience, right? We used to think the brain was fixed and static, and now we're discovering it's actually very malleable and plastic and it's fluid and it can develop in all kinds of ways. We're breaking the spell of solidity in relationship to neuroscience, in relationship to cosmology, in relationship to biology, in relationship to psychology. We used to think the psychology of human beings was fixed. Not so. We used to think the psychology of kids, we didn't really understand that it develops, that kids go through developmental stages on their journey to adulthood. We didn't understand that. One of the great, the first person to break that spell was a guy named James Mark Baldwin in the mid-19th century, a great evolutionary theorist, a pioneering evolutionary theorist, had all kinds of ideas about how human beings develop. And he realized his kid was going through developmental stages, and he began to transfer, transform the way we think about education, the way we think about how to develop young kids. We were breaking the spell of solidity in relationship to the way we thought about psychology and human development. And now we know that adult psychology is not fixed. We used to think adult psychology was relatively fixed. Adults really didn't change and develop that much during the course of a lifetime, but we know that's not true either. So in all kinds of fields, we're breaking this spell of solidity. Even the way we think about matter itself, right? You know, in the way we understand matter. Physics has been breaking the idea, and, and philosophy also has been breaking the idea that matter is, is solid in the same kind of way. And, and there are new ideas about, about the very nature of reality that have to do with breaking this spell. 
We live in a fluid world, a changing world, a malleable world. And what does that mean? It's also a creative world, a world that we can place our hands on in ways we never realized before, a world that we can influence. And a world. It, it, this is an empowering insight to what it means to be human. So the, the person who I think may have captured one of the first people to really capture this idea and speak to it, and he's one of the first evolutionaries, is a guy named Teilhard de Chardin. Now, how many have heard of the Jesuit priest and paleontologist Te, uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, French. So about, you know, maybe a third of the audience. So this is one of my intellectual heroes. He was a Jesuit priest and paleontologist in the early 20th century. And he grew up uh, very, uh, to be, he became a Jesuit at an early age, uh, was a World War I hero, lived in France, uh, was in the salons of Paris in the 1920s, and had this r new, unique uh, vision of the Catholic life and of the theological life based on the idea of evolution. He was using the idea of evolution, and the Catholic Church got so upset with him that they shipped him off to China, wanted to get rid of him and send him into exile and said, we don't want to hear anything about this anymore. We want you to go to China and just stay over there, and, and we'll forget about you. And he went to China, and as a result, he discovered the Peking man in China and became famous as a paleontologist. And he, but so he became famous as a scientist during the course of his life, but they wouldn't allow him to write, to, to publish his religious writings. All throughout his life, he sought to have his religious writings published, but they wouldn't allow it. At the end of his life, he died not knowing if his, if his mystical and religious writings would ever be published. A year after he died, his book came out called The Phenomenon of Man. It had a huge impact in the, in the late 50s and early 60s. It was influential in Vatican II, and it's been influential ever since. And I think we'll see his influence more in the 21st century even than we did in the late 20th. So I have a quote from him from the first line of one of his books. Uh, he says, this is from the first two paragraphs of one of his book of essays called The Future Man. He says, the conflict dates from the day when one man, flying in the face of appearance, perceive that the forces of nature are no more unalterably fixed in their orbits than the stars themselves, but that their serene arrangement around us depicts the flow of a tremendous tide, the day on which a first voice rang out, crying to mankind, peacefully slumbering on the raft of earth, we are moving, we are going forward. It is a pleasant and dramatic spectacle, that of mankind divided to its very depths into two irrevocably opposed camps, one looking toward the horizon and proclaiming with all its newfound faith, we are moving, and the other, without shifting its position, obstinately maintaining, nothing changes. We are not moving at all. We are moving. That sensibility, that recognition, that realization, we are moving. Life is moving forward. Life is moving. I am moving. I am part of this process. That realization is what he was pointing at. And he really captures kind of the, I love that quote, because it just kind of captures this, the spirit of the, of the idea. And I'm sure we can all know people in our lives who represent both sides of that spectrum. Nothing changes. Nothing's, everything's always the same. Human nature has always been exactly the same. Nothing changes. All right, great. So, breaking the spell of solidity. If there's a fundamental idea in the book that really captures what this is about, that, that speaks to it. I one more quote on the spell of solidity, which I love, is a quote by Henri Bergson. Here's another philosopher. Who's heard of Henri Bergson? It's good. Not as many people as Tehard. That's interesting. So Henri Bergson was a philosopher of the late 19th century, one of the incredibly popular philosophers of the time. He used to give lectures in New York and Paris that would be attended by thousands of people. I mean, very, he would fill halls. Very popular philosopher of the time. He's kind of not as well known now, but he was very influential on, on Tehard. And he has this Great quote. Now, I don't expect you to understand all this quote. I'm not sure I understand all this quote, but it still captures something about the spirit of what I'm trying to communicate. He says, life in general is mobility itself. 
particular manifestations of life accept this mobility reluctantly and constantly lag behind. It is always going ahead. They want to mark time. Evolution in general would fain go in a straight line. Each special evolution is a kind of circle. Like eddies of dust raised by the wind as it passes, the living turn upon themselves, borne up by the great blast of life. They are therefore relatively stable and counterfeit immobility so well that we treat each of them as a thing rather than as a progress, forgetting that the very permanence of their form is only the outline of a movement. I'm going to read you that again because I know it's very hard to... They are therefore relatively stable and counterfeit immobility so well that we treat each of them as a thing rather than as a progress, forgetting that the very permanence of their form is only the outline of the movement. At times, however, in a fleeting vision, the invisible breath that bears them is materialized before our eyes, allowing us a glimpse of the fact that the living being is above all a thoroughfare and that the essence of life is in the movement by which life is transmitted. I love this metaphor. I'm going to read you a bit here. I love this metaphor because I'm from Oklahoma. And in the dry, hot days of my childhood summers, I remember seeing what we call dust devils rising up from the recently plowed fields. These were tornadoes of dust, sometimes small and fleeting, sometimes hundreds of feet high and imposing, borne up by the great gusts of Oklahoma wind helter-skelter tempest racing across the plains in a doomed and desperate search for permanence. <coughs> in those fleeting visions that Berkson describes, we can sometimes see for a moment that even the most seemingly solid forms in the world around us, our environment, our cultural institutions, our bodies, our minds, are in fact like that dust, held in place only by the power of this invisible current of evolution that carries us. They are not permanent. They are more motion than matter. The very permanence of their form is only the outline of a movement. All right, so breaking the spell of solidity. So let's keep that idea in mind. That's kind of the foundational idea as we go through the book. Now, and as we go through the talk, the book itself is split up into three sections, and I'm going to speak to each one of them. The first section is really, how is evolution changing the scientific story? How is evolution beginning, and how is our understanding of evolution becoming different? How is it, you know, we think of evolution as being Darwin's idea, right? That's kind of how we think about it. And certainly that's true to some degree. But sometimes we forget that evolution was not Darwin's idea. Natural selection was Darwin's idea, an incredibly, an incredibly powerful scientific breakthrough that will always be remembered and appreciated for. But evolution itself precedes Darwin by at least 50, if not 100 years. And the people who came after Darwin added to it in all kinds of ways. So we don't want to, sometimes we almost reduce what evolution is to a, to a Darwinian mechanism. And I think evolution really needs to be thought of as broader than that. Evolution was never just a scientific idea. It's always had a halo of a, it, in some ways you could say evolution was a spiritual intuition before it was a, a philosophical idea. And it was a philosophical idea before it was a scientific idea. And so I love the science of evolution, but I want to remind us that it's, evolution's always been a bigger idea than just the, the, the simple and straightforward science. So how is our understanding of the science of evolution changing? Well, one of the ways it's, it's changing, and this is very important, is because evolution has this long reputation. And a lot of evolutionary biologists haven't helped this reputation by writing books and titled, titling them The Selfish Gene which is a great book, by the way. But evolution has this reputation of being this dog-eat-dog -dog idea, this selfish idea, this idea that speaks to the dog-eat-dog, to the -dog competitive, selfish nature of what it means to be human. That's its reputation. That's one of the reasons religious people don't like it. That's one of the reasons people reject it. That's one of the reasons people can't stand it, is because they think it speaks to this base quality of human nature. But it's really not accurate to the science. The latest science of evolution in all kinds of ways is telling us not 
just that we're competitive, selfish individuals who are prop, you know, seeking to propagate our genes because of this you know, selfish impulse, but there's other impulses at work in this process. There's altruistic impulses at work. There's cooperative processes at work in this impulse. There's social processes at work in, the, in what evolution is. In fact, we're discovering that sociality, the idea of sociality, the idea of this cooperative instinct in the human character is built into life all the way from the beginning. And even going, be, even going, beyond, even going back before life, that the idea of the social nature of reality is kind of built into the structure of physics even. And so we, never, we should never forget that. Evolution is competitive, certainly. It doesn't mean evolution is not competitive. It is, but it's also cooperation is a part of what's going on here. The evolution of cooperation in Scientific American competition is not the only force that shaped life on Earth. This message has been hard to get out there. This is Howard Bloom talking about the early universe. He says, he's how can an entire cosmos seething with more protons, neutrons, and electrons than we have words to describe? How can a, oh, sorry, that's a different point. Let me read that quote in a few minutes. So the evolution of cooperation. Cooperation is a critical element. It's one of the ways the scientific story isn't what we thought it was, it isn't what most people in the public think it is. The second way the scientific story is changing, creativity. We're discovering that the evolutionary process is more creative than we've imagined. It's more powerfully creative. How can an entire cosmos seething with more protons, neutrons, and electrons than we have words to describe, how can a universe of nearly infinite dice and nearly infinite tosses produce just three varieties of atoms? It's not mere trial and error. So what is it? It's the paradox of the supersized surprise. It's the mind snarler at the core of cosmic creativity. Howard Bloom is a fun writer, as you can tell, and he wrote a whole book called The God Problem, and he, he didn't mean anything religious by that. What he really meant was, how does the universe create? And he spoke about the extraordinary creative nature of the universe and of cosmological evolution. And we're seeing that in biological evolution today with things like epigenetics and new ways of understanding the gene expression, new ways of understanding evolution. We keep, it seems like we keep realizing as we move forward, as the science moves forward, one of the things we keep realizing is, wow, there's more you know, the creative dynamics of evolution are more powerful than we realize. There's more going on here. And that just seems, it seems like every day, it seems like about every few weeks I read an article in a scientific journal or in the New York Times or here or there this, that, that is expanding the creative, the, the, the way in which we think about the creativity of the evolutionary process, even at the biological level. So, how else is evolution, how else is the way we, the scientific story of evolution changing and developing? Well, one of the ways, you know, this is a, a quote by Al Gore, it's making us think about, he says, the emergent, the emergent capacity, this is from his new book, The Future, he says, the, new book, the emergent capacities bursting forth from the revolutionary advances in the life sciences are about to make us the principal agent of evolution. Though we have great difficulty conceiving of geological time, we have nevertheless become a geological force. Though we cannot imagine evolutionary timescales, we are nevertheless becoming the chief force behind evolution. It used to be natural selection. What is it now? It's human choice. We are, the we are creating the environment under which things are being selected for. Right? We are the chief, we are the power. We are the evolutionary dynamic at least at the global level, at the planetary level, right? We, natural selection in some sense has become human choice. So, that's how evolution is changing the scientific story. The last piece of that, and I go into the book, and you, I won't go into it much here, is the technology part. What is this, what is this iPhone, the fact that this is changing every two years, and the fact that now we're going to have Google Glasses, and the fact that now we're, you know, we're going to have, self, where I live in California, they have self-driving cars, you know, about this, you know, you'll be driving down the road, and you'll see a Google, Google car, and there'll be, you know, there's someone in there, but they're not driving, they're self-driving. It's, you know, it's kind of disconcerting, and exciting, and interesting, and, 
You know, just technology is changing so fast. Who knows who Ray Kurzweil is? Some people. Ray Kurzweil is a, techno he's a technological futurist and visionary who just got hired by Google to be their head of research. And, uh, you know, they're probably going to give him billions of dollars to do his research. And you just, the world is changing so fast. And what does technology mean about evolution? And he's theorized a lot about the relationship between the evolution of technology and evolution itself. And he traces, he says, look, evolution's not really about genes. It's not really about, it's about information. That's what's at the heart of the evolutionary story. And you can trace that all the way back to the beginning, into the original information that was coded into the Big Bang and set the laws of the universe in order. You know, that's, what is that at its core? It's information. What do we find at the core of reality? Not just material stuff, but information. What do we find in the DNA? What, what makes it? Information is what makes it's not, it's not the physical pieces. Now, do I agree with that? Should we agree with that? Is that the way it is? Well, I don't know, but it's very interesting. It's very interesting. An information-rich view of what evolution is. All right, I'll leave that at that. But I think it's, it's worth studying, and we need to think more about it. So the next section would be, how is evolution changing the human story? Not just the scientific story. Now we're me leaving behind the, the simple and straightforward science. How is hum evolution changing the human story? What does it mean when we, when, we, when we don't just think about the evolution of the exterior dimensions of our lives, the evolution of the, of the, you know, the evolution of our bodies, the evolution of genetics, the evolution of the exterior of the world, but what's it when we start to think about the evolution of the inside of our psychology, of our cognition? Does that evolve? The evolution of our consciousness, does that evolve? Has it evolved? That's when evolu the evolutionary story gets very, again, we're moving away from the science here, but people have done very interesting work philosophically and in you know, anthropology and cultural studies, thinking about the evolution of culture, the evolution of what it means to be human, the evolution of the inside of ourselves in all kinds of ways. So I want to introduce you to my, one of my favorite terms is called the Flintstones fallacy. Now, the Flintstones fallacy is a term I first heard from a Dutch theorist named Jan Sleutels. And it's the idea that human nature has always been the same, and we just had different technology. That we were exactly the same in the Stone Age. You know, it's just like the Flintstones. We were exactly the same. You know, Flintstones is just a, you know, a, a sitcom drama that was just has dinosaurs instead of a regular technology, right? It's the idea that we were exactly the same 10,000 years ago. We just have new technology now. And this is a very common, I mean, I'm exaggerating it, but more or less, this is the way a lot of people think about human nature. This is the mainstream, generally accepted way to think about human nature. But a few theorists are really questioning this. I read an article in um, somewhere the other day. It was a long article in the New Anthropological Studies where they were really questioning this. And you can see it's just starting to get there. Just, just a few people here and there are really starting to break this fallacy. And I think you'll see that more and more. So the Flintstones fallacy is the idea that we've, human nature has always been the same since for 10,000 years. When we break it, we start to realize, again, break the spell of solidity. We start to realize that human nature, human consciousness, human cognition, human psychology may have been evolving. What if it's been evolving since we became human for 50,000 years? What if our consciousness has been at the interior of our lives? has been evolving for that long. And that really starts to change the way, when we break the Flintstones fallacy, it starts to change the way we think about the evolution of consciousness, the evolution of cognition, the evolution of our interiors. And then all kinds of new ideas become available to us when we think that we can evolve not just in our limbs and our genes and on the exteriors of our world, but we can evolve the interior of our world as well. So the, breaking the Flintstones fallacy, I think, is one of the interesting challenges, intellectual challenges, of our current, of our, of our, of the current kind of, you know, academic climate and, and beyond. 
And so when we begin to break this idea, we start to understand that there's a, a deeper relationship between the evolution of consciousness. And I'm not talking about the evolution, you know, sometimes when we talk about the evolution of consciousness, people think, uh, the evolution of kind of spiritual states of being or something like that. I don't know if this audience is, would think about it like that. But what I really mean by the evolution of consciousness is I mean the evolution of the, of the lens through which you, see the, you and I see the world. That the way a human being saw the world 500, 1,000 years ago or 2,000 years ago was quite different than how we, you and I see the world today. You know, who's heard of Julian Jaynes? Julian Jaynes was a theorist who had a whole perspective on how human beings have evolved, which I don't necessarily believe his perspective, but he had an interesting analysis. He read all the great uh, Homeric literature, the Greek literature, and he noticed that in that literature, you know, human beings in, those, in, those, in, in that literature, they never refer to themselves. Human beings of those times, they never refer to themselves. They never talk about I. All of their motives for actions are in the external, you know, in the actions of gods or the motives of gods. Or, you know, it's like they, they project their instincts outside of them. And so what does it mean when we start to think differently about the evolution of human nature? It's a, it's a big idea. It's a challenging idea. To me, it's a revolutionary idea. And it opens up all kinds of, idea, all kinds of possibilities in how we think about what it means to be human and how we go forward and what it means to be human. And it starts to connect the evolution of cognition and consciousness to the evolution of culture. And then if we realize, if we want to start to change human culture as it develops forward, we shouldn't just worry about changing the exterior institutions of society, the exterior social and political institutions of society. We need to think more deeply about how we change the underlying values and worldviews that are informing those social and political institutions. What worldviews are informing those social and political institutions that are built? How do we change those worldviews? How do we develop those worldviews? And you start to see that we've had a number of worldviews develop over the last 10,000 years. And how do, we, how do we work with those worldviews? One way to think about the science and religion debates is not just to think about science and religion, but to think about two different worldviews fighting each other one of which loves may be particularly attached to science and one of which may be particularly attached to religion, but they're not inherently religious or scientific. They're two different ways of seeing the world that are clashing. How do we negotiate the clash of worldviews? And I'm not the first one to speak about this. It's just people don't speak about this in an evolutionary context so much, right? When people think about the clash between science and religion or the clash between the Lexus and the olive tree, you know that the term, the Thomas Friedman book, the Lexus and the olive tree, right? That was his term for thinking about a more traditional worldview and a more modern worldview. So understanding the evolution of worldviews, understanding the relationship between consciousness and culture is a big part. And look, you know, I know these are big ideas and you think, well, God, you know, you can, you can follow up and read a lot more. Obviously, you can read my book. You, you can read other books about them. You know, there's not time here in this talk to get into all the ways this can impact our lives. But, but I encourage you, if you're interested, to read, to read more and pursue it, because it really can. Um, you know, I was talking to, to Rami earlier, and we were talking about human history. And you're thinking about, well, how do worldviews you know, we, we so often think about human history as a two-step affair. Sometimes, you know, all, it, it, there was the Western Enlightenment, and there was everything that came before, the kind of traditional world that came before. And we, that's as far as we go back often. And so there's kind of a traditional worldview and a modern worldview. And we know where the modern worldview, right? We know where the scientific modern worldview started. It started in the Western Enlightenment. That's pretty clear. We know that historically, right? But where did the traditional worldview start? Where did the traditional, look, any religion has people all different worldviews. But we often think a more traditional religious worldview. Where did that start? Where did that start historically? Anyone have any sense of that? Where do religions really start? The Axial Age is where religions really started. That term, it's not a very well-known term yet. It will become a better-known term. Carl Jaspers, the, the philosopher, invented the term. 
It, he said it was the time when the earth turned on its axis. It was a time about 2,500 years ago. It started about 2,800 years ago from about 800 B.C. to about 200 A.D. How many have heard of the term the Axial Age? A few. This is great. See, I'm introducing all these new... If nothing else, you get a whole bunch of new terms you never heard before. The Axial Age was a remarkable time because between about 500... I'm going I'm to get the dates really wrong here, but it's rough. This is rough. This is when you're a generalist, you can, you can play fast and loose with, with things. Uh, sorry. Uh, so between about 500 BC and about 400 BC or 350 BC, right in that time, in that short space of time, and remember, this isn't early, this isn't, we, have, we don't have mass communication these days, right? You have to take a camel, you know, for weeks and weeks and weeks to get a message somewhere, right? So this is not a time of mass communication, this is 500 BC. In a short space of 150 years, you have this flowering, this human flowering. Four of the world's major six religions are all founded in that time period, right? You, in, in, in India, you have Buddha and Mahavira who live in, around the same time. You have the, found, the founding of Buddhism and Jainism. In China, you have uh, Confucius. Uh, I, I think he's a little more complex when he lived. I'm not sure they even know, but uh, Lao Tzu and Cheng Su. So the founding of Taoism in, in China. In Greece, you have, uh, you have Aristotle and Plato and Socrates and Parmenides and the flowering of the Greek mind. You have several major uh, Jewish figures at the same time who reinvent the Jewish faith. You have Zoroaster in Persia, the founding of Zoroastrianism. Um, there's more, even. It's an incredible time. The whole, much of our world is built on what happened in those 150 years. The whole Western canon, which came out of the Greek canon, is built on that. The Eastern canon, which is built on, you know, Buddhism and Jainism, and you had several major Hindu saints as well, or all, all, you know, Upanishadic saints at the same time. This is 150, 200 years. Something was in the water in those days, right? Something was happening. We don't know what, Right? We had this flowering. It was a little bit like the Western Enlightenment. It was this flowering of, of, of religious consciousness and more at that time. So that was when a new world, what was happening? A new worldview. Human consciousness was breaking into a new level. A new worldview was coming online. A new way of thinking about life, the universe, and everything was happening at that time. And so you had this massive flowering. So the actual age... The, the, and, and then before that, we, know that, we don't have much history before that, but it was, you know, it was a pre-religious. I mean, you have animism and shamanism, but it's really pre-religious. Okay, so thank you for allowing me to go on that little uh, detour there into the Axial Age. It's always fun to tell people about the Axial Age. It's such a unique thing and a unique time. And then you start appreciating, oh, maybe history isn't two steps. Maybe it's five or six major steps. Maybe that's more accurate, you know? We don't know what was going on 5,000 years ago. And maybe we're taking further steps now. What are those further steps? What are the next steps? How do we go forward? What does that look like? How do we see the signs of that, right? So it makes you think. See, when you really think about evolution in this kind of way, when you think about the evolution of consciousness and culture, you don't just think about, well, you end up, you think about the past, but the past inevitably starts to lead you to the future. So you think more deeply about where we've come from and how human beings have emerged, but that starts to lead you into the future. That's the beautiful thing about it. And the last section of what I want to speak about is how evolution is changing the religious story. Well, one of the ways it's changing the religious story and I'll just, is that you start to think about a new, a new ethic. I was talking about this in the, in the, in the Bible class I went to this morning. A, a, new, a new kind of morality, a new kind of ethic, a new kind of morality. You know, we think about religious ethic as, you know, we think about the golden rule. We think about compassion in the Buddhist tradition and the way we are compassion toward. We think about the healing of suffering and the relig a religious ethic, a sense of a spiritual ethic. And those are all, you know, beautiful, noble sense of what ethics and morality and how to act towards one's fellow human is about. Well, as we start to think about 
the development of the human character and the development of human civilization, the development of ourselves and our world and the development of consciousness and the culture and this global civilization we were part of and human emergence and how we've all emerged as part of this 13.8 billion year process and this three and a half billion year process of life and this 40,000 year process of development of human civilization and the last 2,000 years of the of development of historical human civilization. And as we start to see ourselves in that context and start to think about what's next and where we're going and how we're waking up to the fact that we are just realizing, you have to appreciate for a moment, it's only in the last 200 years that we are even realizing we're part of this process. This is why Julian Huxley coined the phrase, you know, we are evolution become conscious of itself. Think about that for a moment. We are evolution become conscious of itself. We are just waking up to the fact that we are part of this process. I was saying this morning in the, in the class, it's like we're driving down the road and we suddenly realize that we're, and, we're, we're, and our eyes are closed and we're trying to drive a car and we're having lots of wrecks as we would if our eyes were closed. Or a self-driving car, maybe it's like a self-driving Google car. Uh, and, and we suddenly, in the last 200 years, what's happening is our eyes are fluttering open. And we're starting to realize, oh my God, look where we've come from. We, we can start to see this process we've been on. And we're starting to understand the dynamics of that process. It's just barely, just starting. And then we can start to see, oh my God, look, that we're on the road. We're, you know, and then we start to see, oh, we're going this way. And where we've come from, what does it mean? And how are we, and, we, and we're starting to ask these questions. And what that allows us to do for the first time in history is to begin to place our hands on that steering wheel and start to have some effect and start to drive and ha not have evolution and the process of cultural evolution be completely unconscious. And you know what evolution is when it's completely unconscious? It means it's driven only by problems, right? It's driven only when things get so bad. You know when someone lives their life and they only evolve as a result of, and, and their lives are very unconscious? They only, result, they only evolve or develop as a result of Massive crisis and problems, right? That's how they develop, right? Life slams them on the head, <laughs> slams them on the head and, and then they walk that way a little bit and then it gets so bad, something horrible, and then they walk that, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but you know, that's what happens to people, right? And that we all live our lives to some degree like that, right? Things have to get pretty bad often. We have to go through major crises before we evolve as human beings. And it's like that as a culture as well. We have to, we have to encounter massive issues and massive problems before we change before we, in our blindness and our unconsciousness, before we decide to change direction and walk the other way or walk another way. And then so we kind of veer from one side to the other and we kind of walk like this. What, we, what, what this perspective starts to allow us is the, 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 the expression of it is we're beginning to open our eyes just over the last 200 years. And this is going to continue for another several hundred years, I'm sure. But we're beginning to open our eyes and recognize that we, our evolution, become conscious of itself and start to take more responsibility for the process that we're part of. And then what does ethics and morality start to look like when we start to think about that? It starts to look like, well, we, we have the ethic of the golden rule. We have the ethic of the healing of suffering. We have the ethic of compassion. Those are all rich, the part of the rich legacy of what care means in a spiritual religious context, right? But now also we, we have to add to that a care for, you know, m for our development, for our further development, for our further evolution of, of us, of you and of me and of us together, a care for the future of life that is suddenly in our hands. We recognize more deeply than ever that that is in our hands. It has been placed in our hands. Are we going to take up that charge, that responsibility? There's a beautiful line, and I wasn't going to read this, but now since I just got to this point, I'm going to, I'm going to read it now. There's a beautiful quote from Julian Huxley about this very thing. He says, it's as if man had been suddenly appointed managing director of the biggest business of all, the business of evolution, appointed without being asked if he wanted it and without proper warning or preparation. What is more, he can't refuse the job. 
whether he wants to or not, whether he is conscious of what he is doing or not, he is in point of fact determining the future direction of evolution on this earth. That is his inescapable destiny. And the sooner he realizes it and starts believing in it, the better for all concerned. Very powerful, powerful way of thinking. So my definition of what an evolutionary spirituality starts to look like, this is the best I came up with. Evolutionary spirituality is evolution-inspired, world-embracing, and future-oriented. It is a creative, anticipatory spiritual path in which salvation, however we define that word, is to be found not in connection to the ancestral spirits of yesteryear, in promises of a heavenly beyond, in achieving a transcendent state of inner peace, or even in letting go into a timeless present, but in fully embracing the emergent potential contained in the depths of an evolving cosmos. Is to be found not in connection to these. So you see, all of those represents legitimate and important ways of understanding the religious and spiritual life. But this is a different way to think about what a spiritual or religious vision based on evolution is about. And there are a number of interesting visionaries, mystics, theologians, who are rethinking the nature of the spiritual and religious life based on this sense of evolution. Evolution inspired, using this cosmological context that we're part of, using the fact that we are evolution becoming aware of itself, embracing that idea as part of their spiritual path or religious path. World embracing. What does that mean? World embracing. World embracing means that it's about the evolution of this world, this world. See, so often in religious and spiritual paths, and this is East and West, this is East and West, and this is, a, I'm going to make a massive generalization, so just Bear with me. I know there's a lot of exceptions to this. But so often in spiritual and religious paths, this world that we're all part of is, can be seen as a little less than where it's at, right? It's a fallen world. It's a samsaric world. It's a world of maya, of illusion. It's a world where that tests us and tempts us and tests our soul a world where we go through trials and tribulations while we wait for what is beyond this world, either nirvana or transcendence or some form of escape into another way of thinking, another state of being, or something in the afterlife, right? That's often the religious part of what the religious character is. Good or bad, there's, and you can say good things and bad things about it, potentially, but I want you to appreciate there's often a subtle or not so subtle what I call anti-world, world-negative view that's, that's part and partial of the religious life. Now, I could talk for a long time about how that evolved and why that's true and the good and bad things about it, and I don't have time for that. But it's just, it's true. Evolutionary spirituality starts with breaking that idea, changing that idea. It breaks that bias. It breaks that bias, that world-negative bias. It's world-embracing. The action is about the evolution of giving oneself to the evolution of this world, the creative evolution of this context, this milieu that we're all part of. One of Teilhard de, Chard One of Teilhard de Chardin's books was called The Divine Milieu. And he meant this world is the divine milieu. This is where the divine is unfolding. In the, in the foreword of one of his books, it says, I mean, it says, uh, the opening, it says, for those who love this world, for those who love this world. And that's because his tradition, that Catholic tradition of that time at least, was so, tended to be so world negative, so, so focused on the hereafter. And he said, my path, what I'm trying to describe to you is about those who love this world. And that was, that's, that was his, one of his great contributions. For those who love this world. So evolution-inspired, world-embracing, and future-oriented. I think I talked about the future-oriented nature of, of this way of thinking about evolution. Because inevitably, the deeper we understand the past, 
the more we're going to think about where we're going. Future-oriented. Two of the great pioneers of evolutionary spirituality, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, who lived from 1881 to 1955, and the other one who I haven't mentioned yet, Sri Aurobindo, a great, you know, I'm, I'm choosing East and West here, probably the most influential, inspired, you know, evolution-inspired uh, mystic and saint and visionary and theologian of the West, and the most, most influential, you know, inspired philosopher, sage, mystic of the East. Lived at the same time, you know, very similar time, more or less, you know, roughly the same time, had a very similar message, didn't know each other, had no, didn't know of each other, both very influential in their own traditions, both have inspired people who come after them in all kinds of ways. Tehard has had a huge influence in the Catholic Church and continues to have influence today. Aurobindo has had a big influence east and west. An extraordinary man, I don't have time to go into his life, an extraordinary man was the leader of the Indian independence movement before Gandhi. How many people have heard of Sri Aurobindo? Ah, it's few, that's great, fantastic. Beautiful writer. If you want to read his book, I recommend the first five chapters of The Life Divine. I'm going to read you a little Sri Aurobindo. He says, The animal is a living laboratory in which nature has, it is said, worked out man. Man himself may well be a thinking and living laboratory in whom and with whose conscious cooperation she wills to work out the, he called it the overman or the superman, the God. Or shall we not say rather to manifest God? For if evolution is the progressive manifestation by nature of that which has slept or worked in her involved, it is also the overt realization of that which she secretly is. If it be true that spirit is involved in matter and apparent nature is secret God, that's one of his, his famous lines. If it be true that spirit is involved in matter and apparent nature is secret God, then the manifestation of the divine in himself and the realization of God within and without are the highest and most legitimate aim possible to man upon earth. Now that's a rich religious and spiritual calling, fully evolution inspired. So when you start reading something like that and someone comes up and tells you that, you know, this evolution stuff has nothing to do with religion and can't possibly have anything to say about religion, you just go, uh, excuse me, you're, you're not reading the right people <laughs> because there are some beautiful, important things that are happening. If, if, if apparent nature is secret God, that's kind of Aurobindo's great line. So Sri Aurobindo, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, two of the great pioneers of evolutionary spirituality. Many of the people who inspire, are inspired by these two are not Hindus nor Catholics. I'm not a Hindu nor Catholic, and yet these are two of my own intellectual and spiritual heroes. Uh, they, their works can be read independently of both of those traditions, and are quite powerful independent of both of those traditions. I certainly would recommend, recommend them both. So how is evolution changing the religious story? It's changing it by creating a, a creative spiritual path that is evolution-inspired, future-oriented, and world-embracing. All right. A few final thoughts. I want to read you one last piece that kind of sums up. It's one of my favorite descriptions of what evolution is, it's by a guy named Brian Swim. And he has a great line. He says, he's talking about science. And he says, it's really simple. Here's the story in one line. This is the greatest discovery of the scientific enterprise. You take hydrogen gas and you leave it alone. And it turns into rose bushes, giraffes, and humans. <laughs> That's the short version, he says. The reason I like that version is that hydrogen gas is odorless and colorless, and the prejudice, in the prejudice of our Western civilization, we see it as just material stuff. There's not much there. You just take hydrogen, you leave it alone, and it turns into humans. That's a pretty interesting bit of information. The point is that if humans are spiritual, then hydrogen's spiritual. 
It's an incredible opportunity to escape the traditional dualism. You know, Spirit is up there, Mather down here. Actually, it's different. You have Mather all the way through, and so you have Spirit all the way through. He says, that's why I love the short version. So that's the short version of evolution. There's a lot more to say about it. There's a lot more in between. So just a few concluding thoughts. You know, don't let anyone tell you, certainly in any part of the world, but certainly in this part of the world, that evolution and religion are inherently incompatible. It's not true. Many different kinds of religious visions can be filled with evolution. And don't let anyone tell you that science is inherently meaningless nor purposeless. You know, science is a process that by itself it may be, but the world that science is revealing is rich and wonderful and beautiful, and it only seems to become more so. Evolution is giving birth to a new way of thinking about the world, a fundamental new worldview, and think in your own lives about how, how you are breaking the spell of solidity, how you could do that more. All of us, it's a very powerful, transformative way to think about our own lives. In what areas of your own life and what areas of human culture do we tend to relate to as if they're static and unchanging and never changing? And when we know that's really not the truth of what's actually going on. And evolution is, cha as evolution changes our understanding of who we are, inevitably new worldviews will be built, new ways of seeing who we are and what the nature of the universe is we live in. And I think that will transform the way we see science, certainly, the way we see religion, certainly, but ultimately the way we even build the institutions of human culture in all kinds of ways, including the social and political ways, in all kinds of ways. And it'll start, for the most part, from conversations like this. So thank you for coming. I'd be happy to ask any, answer any questions you have, happy to pursue any of these points further, but thank you very much. Questions? Yes, please. Can you get some thoughts about alternative theory? Ah, my favorite. You taste them? Yes. Can you address that, please? Jean Gebser talks about mu mu alternative to evolution. mutation. Mutation. About 500 BC. There was a great mutation. Okay, so he's talking about a philosopher named Jean Gebser. Who's heard of Jean Gebser? Hey, a few people. That's good. So Jean Gebser is another great figure like Aurobindo and Tehard, uh, a German philosopher. He changed his name to French because he was so upset about World War II, so he named, I think, John instead of whatever he was. And uh, he had a very powerful awakening in Spain in 1930s, I believe, or late 20s. I think it was in the 30s. And he had a, a spiritual awakening uh, in which he saw, it felt like he saw a new stage of, of, of human development. And, uh, and he wrote. Uh, 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 his opus is called The Ever-Present Origin, a really remarkable gentleman. He escaped Franco and the Nazis, ended up in Switzerland, and wrote the rest of his life. Uh, and he met, interestingly enough, Aurobindo toward the end of his life. Now, what's interesting about Jean Gebser, and I use him as an example of an evolutionary, but the tricky thing about Jean Gebser, and people point this out, he didn't use the term evolution. He felt evolution was too stuck in, in a kind of the materialism and a mechanism of the way people thought about it. It was too stuck in that world, and he wanted to talk about this rich evolution of consciousness, and he felt evolution wasn't the term for that. So he used the term mutation. So some people tell me, understandably, what, you know, what is it, wh why mutation? Why are, you using the, why are you associating him with evolution? But the, and part of the reason is that he, he pointed Toward the end of his life, he wrote an introduction to his last, his work, Ever Present Origin, in the 70s or late 60s, I believe. And he, he wrote in the new introduction to the Ever Present Origin, the examples of this new stage of consciousness that I have seen and that I feel is dawning on human civilization, he called it the integral stage of, of, of culture. Uh, he said that the two examples he pointed to as being representative of that stage were uh, Sri Aurobindo and Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. So clearly, he found great resonance in the evolutionary visions of them, even though he didn't use the word himself. So does, that, does that help? Does that make sense? That's why he used the word mutation. So it's, he meant something similar. But another great pioneer, if anyone's interested in reading, the, it's called The Ever-Present Origin. Or you can read chapter 8, which goes, it gives you a pretty good Gebser overview, or something like that. <laughs> exactly. Got to do that.
All right, questions, please. Yes, please. America's uh, getting less religious. Do you think that's a good or a bad thing? America's getting less religious. Is it good or bad? I don't, it's, it's, that in and of itself is not enough information to know if it's good or bad. Uh, it could be either. See, the way evolution works is it, it, it's inevitably, I, as, we, as we develop as, as, a, as a civilization, as a culture, we, we may get less religious in many ways. But there are great things about religion. That it can be good and or bad. You know, there's, in and of itself, religion, you know, like, like many of the great institutions of human culture, is a, is a, is a much more complex force and to be, to be, you know, to be situated in either of those camps. And so uh, I think we are getting less religious. Ah, oh, that's nice, thank you. I think we are getting less religious probably as a culture, and I think that probably will continue over the next decades. Uh, I think if they'd done the, sur the surveys of, of the under 30s or something, you know, under 20s, under 30s, and under 40s are actually less religious than, than the, you know, so I think we are getting less religious over time. Um, what it will do is it will present new, new opportunities, new challenges, different problems. Um, but as always, you know, it's never quite as simple as it's, as it's good or bad, unfortunately. If, if only it were, things were so, so clear cut. Do you, have a, do you have a take on it one way or the other? Do you have a? I think it's great. You think it's great? OK, it's good. <laughs> it's, good to be, it's good to be clear. It's good. I like that. Well, you know, I think it means that something is moving forward. But that doesn't mean, but, but I don't mean that to be taken as a negative view for, toward religion. Because religion can and should play a critical role in the evolution of civilization, in the evolution of, of, of human consciousness and culture. Evol religion can play a role. It can play a very important role. Healthy forms of religion can play very important roles all over the world in moving people forward in, the, in their own lives and moving the culture forward in history. Religion can play a role. We can't forget the role of that. Now, can it play a very negative role? Yes, it absolutely can. It absolutely can. And, and you know, it often does. Uh, but it can also play a very positive role. We need, we need, and we have to remember that as well. So. Um, are, are you familiar with Daniel Quinn and Ishmael? Ishmael? You're right. Uh, not, it, not intimately. Well, a, a lot of the things Someone you gave say me that book. remind me it. of that work. And it's good. He must the, be a genius. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> At least. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, I haven't. I confess, someone actually. I think someone gave me that book, and I, it sat in my bookshelf for a long time, read, read and I never, it, I never it, actually read it. it. But I will. I will. Thank you. Um, he's pretty critical of the Abrahamic religions and um, how they have contributed to the destruction of, or the ongoing destruction of the earth and our, our yeah. place that we have here. Um, well, and in, in one, of, one of his arguments being that they give us an excuse to have dominion over the world rather sure. than to live within the world. Yeah. That's a, a very important part of his. Right. And, and I think we're beginning to gain some consciousness of that. And when you talk about an increased consciousness, yes. I think that needs to be a very important part of what that consciousness, consciousness is and where we go um, as we move forward. Um, yes. And, but one of the things that says to me is, yeah, you know, religion can be a very good thing. As you said, it can be a very destructive thing. And basically, I think we need new religious forms. Certainly. Uh, and, Certainly. and if we're becoming less religious, as, as I think you're suggesting, yes. it gives us an opportunity to develop those new forms. Yes. And I think as we abandon, or some of us abandon, traditional religious ways of thinking about things, we develop, we put our own creativity. And, and I think we need to put have some way to put co a collective creativity into that process. And, yes. and to see religion as a creative process rather than a, st a static process. And so I like a lot of the things that you said yeah, about right, that right. Uh, escape from a, a static um, Worldly, way of right. doing things. Thank you, thank you. Look, one of, the, one of the great things about religion is it's been, a, it, you know, it means, right, religio means to bind. It's been a binding force. Uh, it, it brings us together, creates community. It's a powerful force for bringing human beings together. And that can be good and bad, certainly, but we, we can't really exist in, in isolation. We don't, 
we don't, that's not the nature of the human character to exist as, as siloed individuals in isolation. And so as we begin to leave behind those structure, those almost kind of tribal structures of, or religious structures of human community, we will need to build powerful and, and important new forms of, of, of the way in which we engage together because, you know, there's a, that's one of the dangers of, of course, of the modern and postmodern world is that sense of existential isolation. And, you know, and people are, you know, I meet people all the time in the progressive worlds who are desperate for community. They're kind of desperate for, they hunger for it. They're desperate for it. And, and that mixture of kind of isolation and being hunger for is something we're going to have to figure out how to, how to achieve some of the qualities of religion, you know, leave behind a lot of it, obviously, but also achieve some of the, some of the incredibly positive things about it at a new level of, a new under, with a new understanding of, of, of that. So th that's just one response to you. But. One of the ways I think about that is that if we think of God as a process rather than God as a being, mm -hmm. um, it gives us an opportunity to contribute to the creation of that process and mm -hmm. the, the evolution mm -hmm. right. of, of that process. Right, right, beautiful. That's a very, uh, very uh, process-oriented process philosophy. Now, pro see, we're going through all the great pioneers here, of all the great pioneering evolutionaries. Another great pioneering evolutionary in my mind was uh, one of the most famous American philosophers, but he's not so well known, a guy named Alfred North Whitehead, who was a Harvard chair, was chair of Harvard philosophy in the early, in the 20s. And an extraordinary uh, philosopher who, who built uh, a, a whole tradition called process philo philosophy, which became process theology, and, and very much along the lines of what you were talking about, that, that God, that this, this sense of whatever God is, that God is sort of, is, is becoming, is incomplete in some sense, and that God is becoming complete the, through the process of the universe's becoming. So God is, is becoming more perfect somehow through the process of the universe is becoming and through intimately participating in the, in the quality of that becoming, we can participate in some sense in God's becoming. And that was his vision. And it was quite a, he also had a whole science, you know, he, was, he had a lot of things going for him, but, but that was one of his visions. Very beautiful. Other questions? Anything else? Yes, please. Up top. Yes, I just want to know if you've done any studies on the importance of the pineal gland and the possible decalcifi decalcification process and its importance in achieving a higher level of consciousness. I have not. I have not. But I think I know some of the work that you're referring to there and some of the thoughts you're referring to. I think I've heard things along those lines, but I'm not one to speak to that in any kind of way that's, uh, that would be informed. I'm sorry about that. No Was problem. there anything particular about it you were... Oh, well, you were talking about linking like the physical reality with the mental and spiritual, mm -hmm. and it's been known that the pineal gland is kind of that uh, gland in the body that kind of links those two. And throughout, some people have theorized about that. Yes, and throughout, I guess, the fall or whatnot, it's kind of uh, became uh, not it's not functioning like it used to. And I was just kind of wondering if there was any kind of studies. You know, I confess about every. Six months or a year, I, I come across someone who has a, a theory about the pineal gland, and, and I just, I've never, someone will mention something to me or say this, or like you, they, you know, mention that, and I've just, I've never, I've never followed it up in a way that I feel like I could speak to it, so I, I, I can't, too, but, but thank you. Any other questions? Any other? Yes, please. Yeah, thanks. I was wondering if at some point you've tried to reconcile your terms for uh, religious evolution with traditional uh, categories in the history of religion when we use words like revival, awakening, reformation, if those words intrinsically have some kind of a supersessional implication, you know, the superiority of one uh, sect or denomination succeeding another, and maybe on the other side of historical change, like in the history of science, I'm not uh, trying to overgeneralize, but you know, something 
like Thomas Kuhn, paradigm shifting or scientific revolutions. Of course, we could talk about the Islamic revolution as well. But you know, maybe my question is, just at some point, do you think uh, evolution of religion with its inherent vocabulary and evolution of science would have to reach some way of uh, you know, breaking down those uh, boundaries, those sectarian boundaries, and uh, move towards something more ecumenical or you know, dissolve those traditional religious forms in some kind of compatible language between those two entities. And you know, of course, we'd go back to people like uh, Snow and Whitehead trying to find that kind of conceptual scheme. So you're asking me about the, the way in which religions develop? Is that, way, is that the question? Is how, how they develop in, the, in, in terms of what you're yeah, speaking I about? Mean, there's Do they develop for something a ecumenical? intellectual history we have about how religions have developed with the um, historical language and you know, words just basically describing change and continuity. So reconciling that with your uh, idea of evolutionary religion tied to you know, progressive kinds of knowledge and consciousness, and you know, how much are you uh, uh, departing from the, that inherent language and, and concepts. I don't know if I'm departing from it, but uh, I, and I don't know. I may not know enough about it to know if I'm departing from it. But but uh, but I, I guess and let's see if this answers. I I mean obviously religion itself. I, I think it was it was formed initially. Some of those initial visions of of the religious mind were part of this. Exp this new worldview that was emerging in the actual age. And then, of course, it, it has continued to evolve and change. So any religion, any major religion, has people at different worldviews in it. You know, there's different kinds of Jesus, depending on what worldview you're at. You know, and Jesus is going to look completely different, depending on what worldview you're at, you, you are at. So there's not one expression of what Jesus is or what Muhammad is. It's going to be completely different how, how, as you evolve. And you can see that, you know, the... The, the, yeah, you, I mean, I talk in my book about, you know, different worldviews in which have ex different expressions of Christ, you know, or, or, but you can take any religion and go, and go through that. And you can see that in the Bible. You can see different worldviews in the Old Testament and the New Testament. You can see, you can already see that, the evolution of consciousness and culture, even in the context like that. You can see how, they're, how, it's, how it's developing, how it's evolving. And uh, so, so inevitably a certain stage in the evolution of culture will result in the religious traditions being more interested in the ecumenical aspect. They'll be more interested in the interfaith and ecumenical aspect. That represents a certain stage in the development of religious traditions. Um, is it right for everyone? No, it won't be right for everyone. There's certain, there's certain stages at which something else will be right for, for that. You know, there are certain civilizations where another stage of religion is going to be appropriate for the, for the particular conditions of that environment, of that culture, where a, a certain type of religion. And so one of the great challenges that we face is, you know, there's certain, you know, it's like, you know, we, one of the things we started to realize is that you can't just apply certain world, you know, one worldview, this is not a one-size-fits-all world, Right? You can't just apply. You can't just go into Iraq and apply a modern worldview and say, "Hey, you just pick it up." It's you know, it, these things take development. They take time. They take, you know. So you can't just apply it. You can't. You can't go into Rwanda and say, "Hey, democracy," and just start start there. Right? It's not the nature of what's happening. It's like you have to, you know, development of culture, development of civilization. We're just starting to understand how that works, and it takes. You know, and, and so a certain religious structure is going to be appropriate for a certain type of cultural situation. And you can't take another, you can't take an ecumenical religious structure and apply it to a certain situation and get good results. You just won't. So it's like you kind of have to, you have to let these things organically evolve in ways, and if we can help that process of organic evolution, then that's fantastic. But if we start trying to apply our own ideas of certain worldviews that aren't organic to the situation on the ground, that's when we run into danger, and that's when we get developmental dynamics that we just, that we, you know, that we, that are, that are, da that are dangerous, ultimately. Does that, may, does that answer your question? Does that help? Yeah, to some degree, uh, but I think, say, we could go back to a time in the Middle Ages of Convivencia where we had cooperation, say, between the, uh, you know, Islamic and Jewish and Christian elements in uh, Middle East and parts of, uh, of Europe. 
uh, but without recourse to that Darwinian uh, conceptualization of evolution, right? Maybe we have another idea of history that's more like cycles that, uh, you know, what, generate and, and degenerate under certain stresses of, of culture or belief systems. And I, I'm sure you could incorporate that into Darwinian evolution because cycles can become spirals as well. And, you know, uh, rebirth can imply a higher uh, stage of, of knowledge or what, religious suitability, like, like you're saying. I just thought maybe in your talk you were uh, projecting, I won't say something utopian, but beyond what, you know, can take root in particular cultures and be more oh. of the human condition from whatever the Flintstones to our present time. You mean where we're going, ultimately? Yeah. Religious, in terms of religious, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly, I don't know. I mean, I think obviously we're, we're le you know, it sure seems like we're, we're, we're going to build entirely new forms of religious traditions that seem as different from current religious traditions probably as the major religious traditions today are as different from the Greek traditions or the Roman traditions, of myth, you know, the Roman myths, the Greek myths. So we're going to build entirely new forms of meaning and purpose that will seem entirely different, I'm sure, from the religious traditions of the day. But that's a, that's a process that takes 500 years or 1,000 years. Yeah. OK, any, anything else? Any other questions? We're probably just about the end. Happy to take one more if there is. OK, I think that's it. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. <laughs>